This is my first family history feast, so thanks for having me. I'm going to begin by talking about the map used to promote today's event. It's the first official survey of Melbourne by Robert Russell, who was appointed as the first Surveyor General of the Port Phillip District in 1836. The survey features the grid that forms the layout of the Melbourne Central Business District. Robert Hoddle was the mastermind behind the grid and took over from Russell as Surveyor General in 1837. The chain that was used to measure the streets is on permanent display at the library in the Changing Face of Victoria exhibition in the Dome Gallery. There are several versions of the map. The original plan is held by the Public Record Office of Victoria. The State Library holds several published editions by English lithography firm Day and Haig. The publication statement at the bottom right of the map says Day and Haig, lithographers to the Queen, but no date is listed. This honour was bestowed upon them by the monarchy in 1838, so therefore it couldn't have been published before then. A facsimile of the Day and Hay edition was photolithographed by the Victorian Department of Lands and Survey in 1911. There was then a reproduction of the 1911 edition in 1986. The version you're looking at now is a printing of the original Day and Hay lithograph, but it has been annotated with colour, street names and allotment numbers. Hoddle's grid has 24 blocks, but an extra eight blocks have been added to the north. The State Library has significant crossover of collections with the Public Record Office. They are the repository of all government records in Victoria, whereas we are the repository of all publications in Victoria. This is a requirement by law called legal deposit and has its origins in the Copyright Act of 1869. Many Victorian publications are produced by government, so this crossover is inevitable and advantageous. There are items we have that the Public Record Office don't hold and vice versa. So coverage of both repositories combined is extremely comprehensive. Now, a quick crash course in the history of European land settlement in Victoria. The first survey of Port Phillip was conducted by Charles Grimes in 1803. He served as Surveyor General of New South Wales and is credited for discovering the mouth of the Yarra River. He reported that Port Phillip was an unsuitable site for settlement. That same year, another attempt was made to find a suitable settlement in Port Phillip by David Collins, Lieutenant Governor of New South Wales. He arrived at Sullivan Bay near present-day Sorrento on the Mornington Peninsula, but settlement was abandoned due to poor soil and lack of fresh water. The Henty family were the first Europeans to settle within the Port Phillip district, now county, country, country Victoria. Edward Henty arrived in 1834 and established a small farm and began whaling at Portland Bay. The Henty settlement was illegal, as their petition to occupy land had been rejected by the British government. In 1835, another survey of Port Phillip was conducted by John Halder Wedge at the request of his mate John Batman. Wedge surveyed 600,000 acres around Port Phillip, acquired by Batman's so-called treaty with the local Aboriginal community. Wedge's survey was a much more ringing endorsement of the area than Grimes, noting extensive open plains, fine rising ground, rich black soil and good hills. John Batman is commonly referred to as the founder of Melbourne, declaring it as the place for a village. Batman's treaty was deemed invalid by the Crown, who claimed the land for themselves. At the time, Port Phillip, also known as Australia Felix, was under the jurisdiction of New South Wales. This survey was the first map to mark the location of the reserved township. Before being formally no named Melbourne, the township had a number of interim names, including Bearbrass and Batmania. Batman clearly had an inflated ego and sense of entitlement. 
The name Melbourne was coined by the Governor of New South Wales, Sir Richard Burke, in honour of the British Prime Minister of the day, Lord Melbourne. It was declared a city by Queen Victoria in 1847 and separated from New South Wales in 1851 to become the capital of the newly founded colony of Victoria. In the wake of the exploits of the Henties and Batman, squatters from Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania, crossed Bass Strait to settle in Port Phillip in 1836. The squatters settled land illegally. It took at least a year for the government to realise what was happening. In 1838, they cracked down and instituted a depasturing licence of £10. The licence legitimised the squatters as pastoralists on Crown land. The first Crown land sales in the CBD were held in 1837. This led to further land sales and settlement of the greater metropolitan and regional area in the decades that followed. The city blocks were subdivided into 20 half acre allotments. I've zoomed in on a veritable who's who of Melbourne, including John Batman, John Pascoe Faulkner and Charles Swanson. The cheaper allotments were going for as little as 18 pounds. The priciest allotment was 1,040 pounds up near Spencer Street. If only I could enter the current property market in Melbourne for that price then I could eat as much smashed avocado as I liked. <laughs> Tracing your family history relies on pinpointing an ancestor at a certain place and time. Maps are essential to achieving that objective. They allow, allow you to locate a place that you can't otherwise find, particularly a place that's changed names. As borders change, so do place names. And it's helpful to know all the names by which a place is known particularly when the name may have been incorrectly scribbled down on an immigration card by someone who had never heard of the location. Historical maps can reveal details about the kinds of lives your ancestors lived. For example, a town plan showing features such as houses, businesses, churches and schools can help you to understand the sorts of jobs and educational opportunities that were, that were available to them. Topography is the study of natural and man-made features of an area, such as creeks, hills, swamps, forests, or the kinds of soils or rocks in the region. With a topographic map, you can see how difficult it may have been for an ancestor to farm the land, or traverse a mountain, or large lake, or to get to the closest town. In the past, these geographical structures served as solid boundaries that seriously affected migrations. Just getting to church or school might have been a major expedition. Maps can help you find other sources of information for your family history research. They can tell you which administrative district covered the area where your ancestors lived. This allows you to check the appropriate district records to further your research. Regional sentence Regional centres often hold records, and this is particularly true in Europe and the UK, where parish registers are important sources of information, and the United States, where local archives and courthouses hold many historical records. If another source, such as a newspaper article or a diary entry, mentions particular locations, a detailed map may allow you to place the exact whereabouts of your ancestor. Maps make it easier to follow the narratives provided by other sources. I'm going to give you a snapshot of our maps collection and the people who use it. We hold over 110,000 sheet maps. The focus of the collection is Australian maps, particularly those covering Victoria, but we also have many international maps. Popular Victorian historical collections include county, parish and township plans produced by the Department of Crown Lands and Survey, drainage plans produced by the Melbourne and Metropolitan Board of Works, and auction plans produced by real estate companies promoting land sales during the land boom of the 1880s. We hold a large number of antique maps, including the first outlines of the Australian coast, charts by Matthew Flinders, early Dutch maps, and 19th century maps of India. In addition, we also have topographic and geological maps, nautical charts, British ordnance surveys, aerial photography, 
and a significant number of geographical and cartographic reference books and atlases. We've digitised over 30,000 Victorian maps and they're available to download freely from our website in high resolution. The collection is used by diverse groups, including researchers and professionals looking at the history of land use. On any, on any given day, we might have local council wanting to locate former toxic waste dump sites, a botanist wanting to find out information about native and introduced vegetation, urban, local and family historians such as yourselves researching land ownership, amateur gold prospectors looking to strike at Lucky, and avid bushwalkers planning their next trek. I'll go through some of the key map collections at the State Library that are particularly useful for family history research. County, parish and township plans. These show the boundaries of property, each property in the area. And as Charlie detailed earlier, they mark the first owner or leaseholder to take possession of allotments from the Crown. But it's important to note that they don't indicate the names of subsequent owners or leaseholders. Although we do have some plans in the collection that have been annotated and the original owners' names have been crossed out. The plans also provide more general information, such as the size and shape of local settlements the location of buildings or other structures, and the location of natural features such as rivers, lakes or mountains. However, the level of detail provided by parish plans varies greatly. Many parish plans provide very little detail, perhaps just marking major rivers or the outline of the coast, while others provide details such as the location of local schools, churches or shops, and the names of streets and parks. Occasionally, plans even include notes on the types of vegetation growing and the colour and quality of the soil. Victoria has 37 counties, 2,004 parishes and 909 township, townships. Within the counties sit the parishes and, with the, and within the parishes sit the townships. We have an extensive collection of over 10,000 plans, but we don't have copies of every Victorian plan. Here we have a plan of the parish of Nepean. Nepean is part of the larger county of Mornington and within Nepean is the smaller township of Sorrento. I've chosen this slide for sentimental reasons. When I was growing up, my family spent the summer holidays in Rye. One of my favourite places in the world is the back beach at Sorrento. The Melbourne and Metropolitan Board of Works drainage plans were produced to enable the design and development of the sewerage system across the Melbourne CBD and suburbs. There are around six series of plans with varying levels of detail. The library holds about 3,000 plans, but we don't hold a complete set. The first series, produced in the 1890s at the scale of 40 feet to the inch, is the most detailed. And those that we hold have all been digitised. The plans show historical streetscape, architecture and environmental information. Each series took many years to complete, with surveying and drafting work sometimes stretching over decades. Surveying usually started in the city centre and gradually worked outwards. And it's important to be aware that most areas were only surveyed once, so if you're hoping to see a property marked on a plan, it would have to have been built by the 1890s or early 1900s. If it was built later, you could have a look at the 1890s plans and see how the land was previously used. Most plans show approximately one or two blocks and six streets. Details include every piece of land owned and a description of whether constructions were of stone, brick or timber. Also noted are fences, drainage, embankments, street channels and bridges. Ownership and boundary information show lodge plans, lot numbers, easements, street names, prominent features, parks, municipal boundaries and spot heights. The plans are consulted for a variety of pur purposes and heavily used. Architects, students, environmental consultants, archaeologists, builders, home renovators, 
gardeners and family historians make up the largest user groups. All are trying to gain a historical understanding of the precincts, buildings, garden layouts, past land uses and environmental features that existed in the metropolitan area over the last century. I like the plans of um, the suburbs like Hawthorne and Kew because they show all the grand mansions and their impressive garden landscaping. The discovery of gold in 1851 led to rapid population growth. The surge in wealth and people established Melbourne as a major centre of trade, culture and finance. By 1890, it was one of the youngest cities in the world, yet had a population of 250,000. Unfortunately, the city's rapid growth was not accompanied by the provision of adequate household and human waste disposal systems. The city was crisscrossed with stinking, overflowing, open-air drains, which channelled household, human and industrial sewerage into cesspools. These accumulated on the lowest lying land, ultimately seeping into rivers and creeks. Melbourne was fast gaining a reputation known to be Smelburn. Medical knowledge was sufficient by the 1890s to link diseases like typhoid with insanitary conditions such as contaminated drinking water, defective drainage and improper disposal of human waste. Melbourne's incidence of typhoid was growing rapidly. In 1890, legislation enabled the formation of the Melbourne and Metropolitan Board of Works, MMBW for short. In 1891, this autonomous body was given responsibility for the, manage, for the management of Melbourne's water supply, as well as a mammoth task of engineering, building and maintaining a functional and cost-effective underground sewerage system. The MMBW was abolished for political reasons in 1992. Current drainage plans are held by Melbourne Water. If your ancestors lived or worked or owned businesses in the CBD or South Melbourne, fire insurance plans can provide you with a high level of detail about the buildings they lived or worked in. This plan shows the block incorporating Exhibition, Lonsdale, Spring and Burke Streets. The part I've zoomed in on shows the Princess Theatre. First issued in 1888, the Milstead Fire Insurance Plans were drafted by a fire insurance company to record detailed information about the form and construction of buildings in the City of Melbourne. The plans are rich in information, including the number of levels in a building, construction materials, location of fire protected and unprotected openings, and the names of businesses. Between additions, changes to buildings were recorded by pasting overlays on top of the original plans. In some cases, we hold several copies of the same volume, each with slightly different overlays. The Melbourne volumes of the Milstead Fire Insurance Plans cover the central city grid, bounded by Flinders, Lonsdale, Spencer and Spring Streets. Later series were split into two volumes and covered streets as far north as Victoria Street. We also hold sets of plans from the 1920s, 1948 and 1962. In addition to the plans of central Melbourne, we hold several sets covering South Melbourne from the 1920s, 30s, 50s and 60s. These include the area now known as South Bank, as well as part of Port Melbourne. From the late 1800s through to the early 1900s, land across Victoria, especially in Melbourne, was rapidly being subdivided and developed, particularly at the height of the land boom of the 1880s. To promote sales of these subdivisions, real estate companies produced bold posters and flyers featuring maps of the lots for sale at upcoming auctions. Most of the library's auction plans were donated by real estate agencies from their own collections. The plans feature suburban areas which were typically being developed as Melbourne's train and tram lines were being extended. But we also have some plans of rural areas as well. Generally, the maps on the plans concentrate on a very small area, showing the location of the blocks of land that were to be sold and highlighting some of the most desirable features of the local area, such as the local shops, train stations and public parks. Many auction plans are very plain black and white posters, showing only the date and time of a sale, the terms and conditions and a simple map of the subdivision. Others, like this one, are highly decorative featuring colourful illustrations, elaborate fonts 
cartoons and even verse. Buyers are frequently wooed with the promise of free train tickets and lunch under a marquee. A caveat to be cautious of the information presented on auction plans, they often feature exaggerated claims about the areas for sale and the maps that illustrate them regularly distort distances to make the lots for sale appear to be closer to valued amenities such as shops or transport. Sometimes auction plans refer to railway stations or tram lines that were never even opened. Some things never change, <laughs> namely elastic truths and fabrication of the facts in the real estate business. Directories were a precursor to phone books. They provided listings of addresses for businesses and householders. Well-known directories I'm sure many of you will be familiar with included the Sands and Kenny Melbourne directories from 1857 to 1861, the Sands and McDougall Melbourne directories from 1862 to 1911, and the Sands and McDougall, McDougall Victorian directories from 1912 to 1974. You can also look up individuals by name or you can look up an address by suburb and then the street name. Prior to the 1880s, many suburban properties didn't have street numbers and sometimes streets are renumbered just to add another layer of complexity. For example, in 1887, Melbourne City Council ordered the renumbering of properties across the city to make houses and businesses easier to find. The listings in directories include the occupant of the property and sometimes additional information such as a profession. Occasionally there are listings for properties that were currently under construction at that time and this is useful when you're trying to establish exactly when a property was built. Some directories included maps either as a part of the main volume or as a separate sheet. At the library some of these separate sheet maps are held in the maps collection. For example, we hold several maps produced by Sands and McDougall. We hold an extensive collection of street directories. There have been several series of directories of Melbourne over the years, including Moulton's from 1911 to 1916, Morgan's from 1917 to 1971, Collins from 1922 to 1952, the UBD from 1955 onwards, and Malway from 1966 onwards. The Morgans, Miltons and Collins Street directories have been digitised up until 1952 and include maps, street name indexes and advertisements. The University of Melbourne have digitised a selection of Malway Street directories between 1966 to 1999. CityScope is a regularly updated series of reports which provide information about properties. They're produced for all the major cities in Australia and we collect the reports for Melbourne. Entries are typically quite brief and may include names of owners and occupants, dates of construction and refurbishments, sales histories, valuations, building names and addresses. Kind of like a modern day Sands and McDougall directory. They cover commercial properties in the Melbourne CBD from 1977 St Kilda Road from 1984, Camberwell from 1988, South Bank from 1991, South Yarra and the Eastern Melbourne Suburbs from 2004, Docklands from 2005 and Richmond from 2007. There's a separate report uh, covering residential properties in the CBD from 1994 onwards. I don't think many people are aware of the existence uh, of these CityScope reports because we receive relatively few requests for them considering the value of the information they contain. I have no doubt that they'll be heavily used in the years to come. Often people want to find information about their ancestors who were in Victoria trying their hand at mining, hoping to cash in on the wealth generated from the gold rush. We have a collection of 570 mining maps thought to be produced by the Victorian Mines Department, dated around 1870 to 1890, that cover the subdivisions of Gordon, Creswick, Ballarat, along with some maps of Bendigo. They include maps of individuals and show land where applications for mining permits were made. The maps also feature the names of people who occupied the surrounding areas. 
And I think, Michelle, you'll be particularly interested in, in this map um, because it shows the location of a gold mining lease in the Ballarat region near Creswick Creek, including existing occupants. A multicultural society was already emerging with some Chinese names and Chinese gardens marked. Large numbers of Chinese made their way to Victoria during the gold rush. Due to Victoria's historic links to Britain, the library has a particularly strong collection of maps covering England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. Early in the 19th century, the Ordnance Survey Department began producing the first of several series of detailed surveys that mapped much of the British Isles. The name Ordnance harks back to its origin in military strategy, with the mapping of the Scottish Highlands following the rebellion in 1745. Later, as the French Revolution was raging, there were fears the conflict could spread to neighbouring England. This resulted in the government ordering its defence ministry, known at the time as the Board of Ordnance, to begin a survey of England's vulnerable southern coasts. Until then, maps lacked the detail required for moving troops and planning campaigns. Roads, hills, rivers, land coverings, and settlements were recorded, offering a bird's eye view of the landscape. The first series was completed in 1870, nearly 80 years after it was begun. Today, the Ordnance Survey remains Britain's official mapping agency. The library has a significant collection of historical British Ordnance Surveys, including the Six Mile to the Inch series. These remarkably detailed plans were published between the 1840s and 1950s. The National Library of Scotland has digitised a huge number of surveys across Britain, including this Six Mile to the Inch series, and these are freely accessible through their website. The historic ordnance surveys are, of course, extremely popular with people doing family history research on their British ancestors. Australia has been involved in numerous international conflicts since European settlement. If your ancestors fought for Australia or migrated to Australia because of conflict in their homeland, you may wish to explore these conflicts in greater detail. We have maps and other items in the collection that enable you to pinpoint the location of battles, towns or regions where your ancestors may have lived or been stationed and discover how wars altered place names and national borders. We hold maps and atlases focusing on battles of World War I and II to commemorate the centenary of World War I, the library has digitised many items in the collection published between 1914 and 1918, including trench maps from the battlefields in France and Belgium and maps of Gallipoli from the time of the Anzac campaign. This series of maps shows the secret army barrage tactics employed by British forces during the Battle of Passchendaele. The British attacked from Ypres in Belgium, planning to drive the Germans from the surrounding dominant ridges, hoping to reach the Belgian coast. The bloody offensive took over three months. The Australian Infantry Division joined the fray a couple of months in. They managed to push the line forward a few kilometres, but at heavy cost. There were nearly 11,000 Australian casualties in just over a week. On the 4th of October 1917, the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Australian Divisions captured Broodsend Ridge. It was an important victory. Finally, another attack was made against the village of Passchendaele. Ground was taken under heavy fire but couldn't be held. In appalling conditions, with casualties rising, the Australians fell back. The troops were utterly spent and could do no more. In mid-November, they handed over to the Canadians. The library has also purchased an online database called the First World War. It features an interactive map that visually represents many of the key fronts and uses a timeline to display the course and movement of the conflict. There is a gallery of around 1,000 original maps from the period relating to the Western Front in Belgium and France and includes coverage of the battles at the Somme, Ypres, Cambrai, Luce and Neuve-Chapelle. The library has recently purchased a database called Mapping the World, Maps of Travel and Literature. 
The strength of the content lies in its broad coverage of international material from 1640 to 1946, with particular focus on the 19th century. There is a large British component relevant to Commonwealth colonies with representation of countries and continents whose populations have migrated to Australia in recent times, including Africa, South Africa, India, Malaysia, China and the Middle East. You can access over 10,000 maps that can be viewed in zoomable, high resolution with the facility to download as good quality PDFs. Exclusive content comes from the British Library, the National Archives in Britain, American Antiquarian Society and the University of Alberta. To conclude, I'd like to illustrate putting some of my own family history on the map by sharing some stories about my paternal grandfather, great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather. I'm the youngest of six children and my grandfather was the only grandparent still alive when I was born. He died when I was two. I'll begin with my great-great-grandfather, Edwin Ryan. He was born in 1851 in Ballsbridge Island, about two miles from Dublin. He left Dublin as a seven-year-old aboard the Empire Queen and arrived in Melbourne in 1859. The family settled in Bendigo. Edwin married Anna Maria Dumphy at St. Alipius Ballarat in 1871, and they had nine children. In 1876, he was residing in Richmond and was appointed as a constable with Victoria Police. The nature of the job meant the family moved frequently. Edwin had posts in Ballarat, Yandoit, Glen Lyon, Newstead, Emu Creek, Swan Hill and Oakley. By 1898, he was a sergeant of police and finished his career as an inspector in charge of Ballarat and district. He retired to Clunes and lived there until his death in 1931. My great-grandfather, Edwin Christie, was born in 1880 in Yandoit. He enlisted for service in the Boer War in 1900 and had two tours of duty. Following in the footsteps of his father, he joined the police force in 1903. He married Ella Mary Cook at St Ignatius Richmond in 1906 and they had six children. The family lived in Benambra, Cunningham, Frankston and Mortlake. By 1911, he was a sergeant and had postings in Paran and Ballarat. Towards the end of his career with the police force, he was promoted to sub-inspector in, in 1934 and was in charge of the St Kilda Road Mounted Depot. He died in Alwood in 1948. My grandfather, James Francis Ryan, was born in 1913 in Cunningham, Lakes Entrance. He was a clerk before joining the police force in 1934. Law enforcement was clearly a genetic predisposition. Pop served at the depot, Ru Russell Street Station, and spent time as a wireless operator and on motorcycle patrol. In 1939, he married Honora O'Donnell at St Patrick's Cathedral in Ballarat. During World War II, he was an instructor based in the Army Commando Squadron. The commandos did their training at Tidal River, Wilson's Promontory, before being stationed in Darwin. He spent a couple of years in Darwin and was there during the bombing. The Brisbane Line was an alleged plan to abandon Northern Australia in the event of a Japanese invasion. Labor accused the Menzies government of implementing the controversial plan and a royal commission ensued in 1943. The commission found that no such plan had been official policy under the, the Menzies government. Unofficial, official, unofficial I would say, the role of POP's commando squadron was to uphold the Brisbane line for as long as possible. Thankfully, this role didn't have to be carried out as an invasion never eventuated. After World War II, he worked for the Immigration Department. At that time, Australia believed there was a need to increase its population to avoid the threat of another invasion and launched an immigration program with the slogan, Populate or Perish. Hundreds of thousands of displaced Europeans immigrated to Australia, with more than three million people immigrating during the late 1940s until the 1960s. The pool of displaced Europeans who could be recruited for Australia was severely depleted by 1950, 
Italy offered eager candidates, but Italians were considered less desirable than Central and Northern Europeans, yet they were preferred to Cypriots, Greeks and Maltese. The hard work carried out on farms and cattle stations by Italian prisoners of war interned in camps throughout Australia during World War II increased appreciation of Italians as committed workers by their Australian employers and demonstrated their value in the economic development of Australia. Pop flew to Italy three times to interview Italians aboard the migrant ship Fair Sea before it set sail from Naples to Melbourne. These interviews were carried out to streamline the employment of the immigrants once they arrived in Australia. After this, he was a publican at the Bridge Hotel in Bungaree and the Foundry Hotel in Ballarat. He retired to Melbourne and died in South Caulfield in 1984. Before I wrap up, I'll briefly talk about accessing maps at the library and the research guides available on our website. Maps can be requested for viewing by the public in the library's secure Heritage Collections reading room. We require 24 hour, hours notice for map requests. As a general rule, we don't retrieve maps that have been digitised. The rationale for this being that we have a responsibility to preserve collection material in perpetuity. Limiting the unnecessarily hand, unnecessary handling of original heritage items by making less vulnerable formats available assists us uphold this responsibility. You've taken in a lot of information today and during this presentation. The library has created research guides on a number of popular research topics, including maps and family history. <laughs> There's about 16 of those. You can access these on the library website. Much of the content I've covered today is represented in the guides, so you can explore them at your leisure. I hope you've been given an insight into the depth and breadth of the maps collection at State Library Victoria, and that you will access its riches to put your family history on the map. Thank you.